It is a fine September day. As we paddle westward, I perceive that a new season has come. The air is incredibly clear. The surface of both land and water is bright. I am struck by the superfluity of light in the atmosphere in the autumn, as if the earth absorbed none, and out of this profusion of autumn light came the autumnal tints. Think what a change has within a month come over the landscape. Then the general, the universal hue was green. Now see those brilliant scarlet and glowing yellow trees in the lowlands a mile off. Or see that crowd in the swamp, all vying with one another, a blaze of glory. We are not prepared to believe that the earth is now so party-colored and would present to a bird's eye such distinct masses of bright color. If you would study the birds now, go where their food is, the berries. The poke is a very rich and striking plant. Some quite dazzled me with their now purple stems, their bright purple racemes. I love to press these berries between my fingers and see their rich purple wine. It speaks to my blood. I see maple viburnum berries, blue-black, but with little bloom. Some haws of the scarlet thorn are really a splendid fruit to look at now. Now, also, bright-colored fungi of various colors begin to compete with these fruit. When the colors come to be taught in the schools, these fungi should be used by way of illustration. I was just thinking it would be fine to get a specimen leaf from each changing tree and shrub and plant in autumn, outline and copy its color exactly with paint in a book, a book which should be a memorial entitled October Hues or Autumnal Tints. In Hubbard's Meadow I see a great many large spider's webs. They are the yellow-backed spider. I count 64 such webs there, and in each case the spider occupies the center, head downward. Asters and goldenrods are the livery nature wears at present. The latter alone express all the ripeness of the season, and shed their mellow luster over the fields, as if the now declining sun has bequeathed its hues to them. The gardener, with all his assiduity, does not raise such a variety, nor so many successive crops on the same space, as nature in the very roadside ditches. To my mind, the hay-scented fern has the most wild and primitive fragrance, the early morning fragrance of the world, antediluvian, strength and hope imparting. They who scent it can never faint. The young black birches about Walden are now commonly clear pale yellow, very distinct at a distance. The black birches and red maples are the conspicuous trees changed about the pond, not yet the oaks. Methinks hawks are more commonly seen now. I see four or five in different places. How indispensable our one or two flocks of geese in spring and autumn. Trying the other day to imitate the honking of geese, I found myself flapping my sides with my elbows. The regular phenomena of the seasons get at last to be the phases of my life. The seasons and all their changes are in me. I would have nothing subtracted. I can imagine nothing added. November 9th. Steadily but unobserved, the winter steals down from the north. Little did we think how near the winter was. 
Slate-colored snowbirds flit before me in the path, feeding on the seeds on the snow. Saw also some pine grosbeaks, magnificent winter birds, among the weeds and on the apple trees. Some of them are seen to have gorgeous heads, breasts, and rumps with red or crimson reflections. January 20th. I doubt if I can convey an idea of the appearance of the woods yesterday, as you stood in their midst and looked round on their boughs and twigs laden with snow, the wintriest prospect imaginable. The trees covered with snow admit a very plain and clean light, but not brilliant. A sort of white darkness it is, all the sun's splendor that can be retained. You glance up these paths, embowered by bent trees, as though the side aisles of a cathedral, and expect to hear a chorus chanting from their depths. There are certain places where the river will always be open, where perchance warmer springs come in. There are such places in every character, genial and open in the coldest season. February 12th. I saw thin cakes of ice forced up on their edges and reflecting the sun like so many mirrors. Whole fleets of shining sails giving a very lively appearance to the river. The hooting of the owl, that is the sound my red predecessors heard here more than a thousand years ago. It rings far and wide, occupying the spaces rightfully. Grand, primeval, aboriginal sound. There is no whisper in it of the Buckleys, the Flints, the Hosmers who recently squatted here, nor of the first parish, nor of conquered fight, nor of the last town meeting. The tints of the sunset sky are never purer and more ethereal than in the coldest days of winter. This evening, though the colors are not brilliant, the sky is crystalline and the pale, fawn-tinged clouds are very beautiful. After December, all weather that is not wintry is spring-like. How changed are our feelings and thoughts by this more genial sky? In the afternoon, to Sawmill Brook, it feels as warm as in summer. You sit on any fence rail and vegetate in the sun and realize that the earth may produce peas again. This day, like yesterday, was as incredible as any other miracle.